Oh, thank you all. SRO, this is just wonderful. And it's in the, the AC in this room is, oh, yeah, this is a good little advancer, that? Laser Oh, that's perfect. That's yeah. wonderful. That's advanced. Yeah, this is advanced. Okay, got it. I got it. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Dennis. <laughs> Yeah, the AC in this room is pretty good, so I think we're going to be okay. And I, you know, I, I got to digress for a minute. When you're up in northern New England in the winter and you go to a contra dance, you go to these little uh, grange halls. The music's great, fiddles and such, you know, live music. And everybody's prancing around and getting their winter exercise. But the deal is when they start, when everybody gets into the room, the grange hall is cold. And you know, this is northern Vermont. My God, it's zero degrees outside in, in January. And then after about an hour or so, the hall is, is up around between 70 and 80. You step out into these beautiful starry nights, and as that moisturized air comes out the windows and hits those uh, northern boreal nights, it goes to steam. And the, hall, the light is blaring out of the hall. The stars are above, and the steam is just pouring out of the hall. <laughs> Fortunately, we will not be in that position. Tonight, Instead of talking about boreal scenes, we're going to talk about gardens. We're going to talk about osprey gardens and the lessons that can be derived from osprey gardens. And it has been my pleasure to be out, in and out of osprey gardens for 50 years. And not only are they gardens, but they're also field laboratories. The osprey is a wonderful species to study uh, because um, for many reasons, it does. It basically does everything out in the open, and, and there's an element of rigor that has enabled us to use it for good science. And my argument tonight that we are going to continue to do it. There's a new, a new lesson to be learned from the osprey garden, and one of the prime uh, learners of that lesson is in the back of the room. The lights have gone off. Perhaps you'll have a chance to meet her. She's written a beautiful senior thesis out of the University of New Haven. And she is now the uh, coordinator of Connecticut Audubon's Osprey Nation. And that's Melina Gianmatidis. And right next to her is her very distinguished predecessor who did this for a couple years while a student at UConn. And that's Genevieve Nuttall. You should all uh, plug into Connecticut Audubon to to, um, to the uh, Osprey Nation, and if you uh, if you have a nest to watch, if you can be a volunteer, uh, so much the better because this is classic citizen science of a high order. And as you will see, I will argue tonight that um, it's utterly germane that this talk is going to be about sixty percent ospreys and forty percent menhaden. And Connecticut is, of course, a state where people are very interested in, in fish and in migratory fish. We have the ongoing uh, management of the alewife. We have the great restoration of the shad, uh, which partly benefited from the so far failed restoration of the salmon. But all those fish ladders on the Connecticut River support great numbers of shad that go upriver. And um, I guess you could say that the Menhaden has been the sleeper in all this. It's it's it's. I'm going to try to um, give you tonight, and in my own ongoing work, um, raise the profile of the Menhaden to where it should be, because we are all benefiting as coastal dwellers enormously from this fish's unique role that it plays in our uh, ecosystem. And we're all stakeholders in the management of this fish and in the, um, in the necessity that it be maintained in an abundance uh, to perform these very fundamental ecosystem ecological functions. And this is an issue uh, because everybody wants a piece of these fish. They're commercially very valuable as well. Uh, there's a model monitoring program which is being set up through the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission. It's, it's in progress right now. Um, and uh, as you know, this is a form of regulation. And there are certain forces at work that are not really in favor of regulation. And this is an extremely benign form of regulation that we are all stakeholders in. So I've already given you the conclusion of my talk, but sometimes it's a good idea to let people know where the talk is going, and then after you see the pictures, um, I'll restate that again. But this is, a, this is an activist talk, and I suppose a slightly provocative talk, although it, it, it makes an awful lot of sense to me, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. 
So here we are. Um, this is my Osprey Garden, the one where I got started with the guidance of Roger and Barbara Peterson. This is Great Island at the mouth of the Connecticut River. And this is one of the truly great places in the state of Connecticut. It's a place where you, I'm not in your way, you can see, right? It's, it's a place where you all can go. There's a state landing off to the right, not shown there. Um, you can launch a canoe, a kayak, a small motorboat, and be all around this. You see my Yes. And this beach here is fair game. There's a big southwest sand beach on this, uh, which is not a piping plover preserve. The, the predators ramble around here, the raccoons and such. So if the weather's reasonably good, you can come around here and walk this whole beach and survey the beauty of the ospreys from here. Or you can do it, the, the state landing is about in here. There's a wooden elevated platform there, and you can watch the whole thing from there. So this is yours. This is State of Connecticut. It's a public wildlife area, and, and um, if I may say so, it's a lovely place to go, which really doesn't get get all that much use. I would, I would go on a weekday, and I'd go early in the morning or late in the evening. And uh, early in the season and late in the season, um, you'll have it to yourself, along with the ospreys, of course. And these are the inhabitants, of course, the, the great fish hawk. Um, and already you'll see the theme here of uh, the Menhaden like the osprey. Roger Peterson had this expression in, in his field guides for a given bird is all field marked. Well, Menhaden are all field marked too, and when only half of them is there, you still have this diagnostic forked tail which looks translucent yellow when any light is shining through it. And this is a key point that I want to make, that our observations of the osprey now uh, must extend precisely to their uh, predation, to the prey base. And this is what Melina has been doing with her thesis work as well. And I will state her conclusion, which is, uh, it's very supportive of my hypothesis. Um, she's found with sampling on down the sound, watching various osprey nests, that men are absolutely fundamental to the osprey reproductive effort all down the sound. The ospreys continue to march down the sound, somewhat dependent on nest sites, which are provided by Terry, I suppose. I didn't really need to introduce Terry, but, but, but he's kind of, I call him Johnny Osprey Seeds. <laughs> he's, he's the man. He is the man. And the ospreys seem to know it. And I'll tell you, sometimes down in the Chesapeake, we really need Terry down in the Chesapeake. I really should kidnap him and take him down, because... Of course, the Chesapeake is a stupendous osprey garden, and we have nest site limitation down there as well, and we have situations where ospreys come in, and they literally uh, petition human beings for a new nest site, because they know about platforms. Down in the Chesapeake, a lot of them are poles out over water. And so in things I've been writing lately to try to promote this, I refer to ospreys as unrequited lovers of human beings. <laughs> well, as you all know, uh, if you ask human beings to do favors for you, it's a rather tricky business. Uh, uh, but the fact is that ospreys have done pretty well with human beings, and that, I think, will continue to be do true, thanks to people like Terry and Melina and Connecticut Audubon. So in the old days, let's go back uh, 50 years and more, um, the osprey work went on, I got into it in 68, um, it went on for 10 years before that, because what happened uh, was that uh, Roger and Barbara Peterson moved to Old Lyme from, from Glen Echo, Maryland. Roger had Houghton Mifflin, the field guides, and he had his Audubon, National Audubon and American Museum of Natural History connections in New York. So he was splitting the difference by living in Old Lyme and riding the old New Haven Railroad, which was a good thing because Roger was an abominable driver. So that <laughs> within, limits kept, within limits kept him out of trouble. Um, and uh, Peter Ames was a graduate student at Yale. It was an old tradition of Yale graduate students helping with the Ospreys, Tom Lovejoy being one of them who went on to great uh, fame as a conservationist. And initially what they found, Roger had moved there partly because of this osprey colony. Roger always had a great fondness for ospreys. And um, they found that the, the uh, eggs weren't hatching and the uh, birds were declining at like 30% a year. Uh, and this would have been when DDT was really kicking into the system big time. So the first osprey experiment, the creation of the garden, if you will, was these platforms. 
and, and this was the old style platform. It, it, it has a collar against predation, but we've improved them since then. But all over Great Island, these were installed. The reproduction of the birds increased almost not at all. And uh, although they took to the platforms with great alacrity, as they still do. And at the end of the DDT era, 19, the early 1970s, there was only one nest left on Great Island. Great Island now has about 25 nests, and the surrounding area would bring it up to about 40 nests. And the Connecticut River estuary from the mouth there on up to the uh, Goodspeed uh, East Haddam Bridge is well over 100 nests, maybe 120. So a, a complete um, or a near complete recovery has been made, given that there aren't nearly as many dead trees as there used to be in the old days, and the birds are nest site limited. So this is the old story. The first lesson from the osprey garden was the DDT lesson, and among other things, we found these eggs just collapsing under the incubating birds. And, and in the time when we found this, uh, the, the, the case on DDT was not fully made yet. Rachel Carson's very courageous and visionary book came out in 62, and she showed real guts in science to get out ahead of the curve and connect the dots and, and erect the hypothesis, if you will. And it was my privilege, starting in 68, with a whole group of related species and graduate students, to be the people to flesh that out and, and learn what was really happening. So it was a lovely time uh, to, uh, to become an ecologist. It was the making of me and of many other people as ecologists. And I would argue that now we're in another wave of need for this. Um, we're not going to get it out of the public sector, at least not out of Washington. And um, we're stakeholders in, in the earth, we're stakeholders in the state of Connecticut, and we're stakeholders for beauty of these, <laughs> these natural galleries of art. So uh, I think you're all here partly because you understand that, but I, it's worth saying anyhow. Yeah, there's 50 years ago. <laughs> well, what can I say? A friend of mine put an article in, in the New York Times Magazine at that point, and I, I probably lived off that article for about three years. <laughs> it, was, it was a good deal. So you see me there asking a question of that young osprey. And here we have, um, this is how you make an osprey garden. You just plant these poles, and you build it, and they will come, as you all know. And, and um, one of the guys there is Bruce Noyes, and uh, a friend of his is here, and I just wanted him to know that, uh, that Bruce is in this picture here. Um, uh, Terry is not, but, but Terry inspired this sort of thing. This does no harm to the marsh whatsoever. Basically, you, you dig a hole in the marsh. And I, I sometimes say that Great Island and the adjacent areas are, are basically the front lawn of all lime, and these are the living lawn ornaments. <laughs> and of course, it's a great lawn, salt marsh, uh, beautiful patens marsh along here because you don't have to mow it and uh, you don't have to water it, you know, um, the tide does just fine. And of course, it's full of other nesting birds. Starting about now, um, the, uh, the willets, oh yeah, and you put up the pole and the ospreys do the rest, of course. <laughs> And sometimes they really do the rest. <laughs> this is what, what the new platforms uh, look like with the predator guard. And actually, Terry, Terry had a critical comment here. He said, pull that nest is too big. That's too much weight on the top of that. So one day when he went out, came out with me, I got up there and removed about half of that material. But it is important to have a significant amount of material on these things, because when these birds come back, as you know, they come back to the end of winter, essentially. And when they're first uh, down on those eggs, uh, one of the measures of the quality of a nest is that the birds have a lot of material around them so that they can thermoregulate properly, so that they can sit out there in the rugged uh, weather of April and even of May and um, transfer heat <coughs> properly to the eggs and not get totally um, challenged by the, uh, by the cold of the coast. Because, of course, they're interrupting their tropical vacations to do this. You know, you put this in human terms. It's, really ghastly. They're down in these lovely tropical places and they haul off and come back to the end of winter. But of course this is natural selection. This is about passing your genes on about successful reproduction. And as I said, early in the season you have these flood tides. Uh, it's kind of pleasant to slosh around out on the marsh, but it's too early in the year really for a lot of things like willets and salt marsh barrows, marsh wrens. Uh, clapper rails, those all have to wait a little while before they commit to nesting on this marsh. About now, 
you're really starting to get a lot of the marsh birds laying. The other thing that has to happen is the marsh has to green up enough so that there's more cover. We're about at that point now, too. So it would be in weather like this, um, checking osprey nests, that you might kick up these other marsh birds. And that's, of course, part of the garden aspect, too. And this is pretty typical. You notice this is not, a, not an un, unaltered system. There are, it's crisscrossed by these mosquito ditches. And this is where you're going to, to um, when you ple very pleasantly trape across. I, I wish one of the trends we're having is a lot of very, they really are taming down and getting used to human beings. But this is the only nest where I can come up with a mirror and the female doesn't flush. She scolds me and she backs <laughs> off and lets me check. And I, 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 I don't know, this may be a future for ospreys and human beings. I'd like to think so, that they, <laughs> they will get this tame. I call this my say-ah picture. <laughs> OK, what's happening is a lot of role division uh, during the breeding period, because the male is basically the commuter and the, and the provider of food. And there are, with, whenever you put up an osprey platform, you should put up a feeding perch close by. And God knows how long this overpost has been here. You see it's all stained with fish oil, with menhaden oil, and there are scales there. You see the size of these wonderful uh, talons on the osprey. This is very helpful in, um, in identifying prey as well, because it's very stereotyped behavior. The males come in with the fish, and they, they eat the head on that post before it goes into the female. So you've got a lot of time to look. And again, menhaden, as you'll see in a minute, are really easy to identify. And uh, there's also, I think, um, a matter of nest hygiene here, that by the time uh, the female sees that this meal is coming, her physiology charges up. It's also true of the young are there. And um, so she takes the fish when it gets to the nest, and she goes usually off on a perch. Uh, once the young are there, the fish stays in the nest, but it, it doesn't linger in the nest. So the eggs of flies and beetles that are not are, don't don't wind up contaminating the nest to speak of that. Fish is disp dispensed relatively uh, quickly. And this is a Chris Rowe picture, one of, another one of the great heroes of this whole osprey story, and, and indeed. Uh, can, uh, a reigning wildlife photographer in, in Connecticut is Chris Rowe of Old Saber. He takes amazing pictures, pictures that are living biology. And so here, here we have an osprey toting a menhaden. And you see the uh, see that field mark tail there. Here's our here's the fish, the object of our affection, uh, other than the osprey. You know, um, the deal is, of course, that. Uh, marine biology for most of us is relatively abstract. It's, it's occurring in the water. When you start going to marine labs, which I've done in my loon studies, you learn that it's not like terrestrial ecology. The parameters are highly variable. Uh, they can be different from year to year. Uh, and it's a level of abstraction that simply isn't occurring when you're working up on land. So when you have a, a sea land connection like ospreys and menhaden, it's an obvious entry point. And this is a planktivorous fish. This is the key that this fish is this fundamental link between the plankton. And we, with all our uh, operations, crank a lot of nutrients into Long Island Sound. That produces big plankton blooms. And, and, and this fish, is, as a planktivore, is, makes a link with things like bluefish, striped bass, uh, which, in, which, of course, are prime food fish for us. And they're, they're game fish. Uh, some of the prime speakers at the hearings on Menhaden management last fall were uh, Connecticut fishing guides who run out of Bridgeport, run out of Old Saybrook, and various places, taking party boats out to fish for uh, bluefish and striped bass. And we all know from going to various fish counters, these are prime local fish. So, so these this makes us stakeholders, folks. This this fish is absolutely at the core of Long Island Sound uh, pro productivity. And, and um, Long Island Sound is a, a sanctuary for the fish. There's a very little commercial harvest of menhaden here, uh, quite in contrast to farther south, where there's a lot of harvest. And that's what these uh, regulatory initiatives are about. So there's another picture I should add. I had a, um, an Isaac Newton moment with menhaden. Um, <laughs> was in the autumn of the year. I've got an island that I study uh, autumn migration on. It's a trap along the Chesapeake. It was actually predicted by Roger Peterson, 1948, Birds Over America, a lovely book, John Burroughs Award winner, that there would be 
uh, um, some, some migratory traps along the eastern shore, and there is. And there were also great numbers of eagles there, and I hadn't really paid much attention to it until all of a sudden one day I was walking out to the edge. It was a pink pine tree and an eagle flushed it, and the men had just about hit me on the head. <laughs> and suddenly I realized this was a great uh, September area for these adult men. And, um, and of course, it's not just, uh, there are a whole variety of fish eating birds that use them at different points in their life history. Um, let's see. So you see, here's this lovely diagnostic tail again. Notice this blunt head. They gape that mouth. We've got some pictures coming. Okay, the great engine of Menhaden production has been the Chesapeake Bay, and you see these, this enormous dendritic system. That's 170 files, five miles long. The reason that Menhaden ha haven't been clobbered like some of the anadromous fish is that they, they spawn out here in the coastal zone, and then the larvae make their way in the, into the estuaries. So they've never had to deal with dams, and it's never, they've never had to deal with these human interferences. And also they love plankton, and God knows we put a lot of plankton, we put a lot of nutrients into the system. So they're a fish for the future, you might say. This is what they look like um, in the estuaries. Uh, when they, These are called peanuts. These are about four or five. This is a, a lovely Chris Rowe picture. And you notice they're already intensely social fish. They, they occur in schools. What's happening at Great Island is like a big beehive. They're going out to where the patches are at the mouth of the Connecticut River and in the Sound. And, and the Connecticut River is really optimal habitat for, for Mountain for a variety of reasons. <laughs> this is earlier in the game. It's a little bit of a reverse phenology here. This is down in the Chesapeake. And the, the, that crease has a, uh, probably has a couple hundred smaller Menhaden, maybe an inch long under it. This would be like a July picture. <laughs> and it, this is about 80 degrees in the air, but water is very well. This is a full soup of plankton. So you multiply that by thousands of such creeks, and you realize the engine of Menhaden production. <laughs> However, the, the striped bass has come back so strongly in the bay that we, it's not clear how much of an increment we're getting uh, from the Chesapeake. Uh, and here are some. What I was saying, these are peanut menhaden that have come out of a freshly caught bluefish. Bluefish, as all of you probably know, have teeth, so these <laughs> fish look like they've come out of a wearing blender. Um, a striped bass has a soft mouth, and the next picture I should have here is a peanut menhaden coming out of a striped bass, and they're relatively intact. And when you catch fish to check this, uh, this was actually part of my loon studies, because obviously I can't collect loons to look at their feeding studies. Loons in the autumn of the year, make big flock feeding stopovers on schools of Pin and Medhaden. And I'm writing a book about all that. Um, but the next picture would be a bass picture. So here we see it in action. Again, thanks to the great Chris Rowe. You see those gaping mouths. You see how tightly schooled these fish are. And you see their water full of plankton. That picture is a lovely picture that tells the whole story. Now this is what happens when something disturbs the fish, and, and, and again, uh, it gives you a sense of uh, just how tightly schooled they are, what a social creature they are, and that enables a virtuosic osprey to take, to take two at once. Yeah, yeah. Now the ospreys are very good at what they do, and I think it's terribly important just to make a comment about non-human intelligence here, because there's a great deal of intelligence out there. But it's forged in natural selection. So of course it's not going to be our kind of intelligence. You think about everything that's involved in osprey migration, in the building of the nest, in the role division. Uh, when they come back in the spring, they've had separate tropical vacations. So the male has to start provisioning the female. Um, and then, of course, there are all the skills that the male has in order to be a provider of the nest, all the things. It's a constant learning curve, and these birds can potentially get to be as much as 20 years old. Um, there are a lot of ospreys out there that are anywhere from about 10 years old or 8 years old, let's say, to, to the late teens. Also with loons, while well, I mentioned the oldest loon now is 30, and, and there's plenty of loons uh, that are in between uh, 10 and uh, maybe even as much as 25 years old out there. Loons, I, I've only studied loons for 30 years, so they're kind of a novelty. <laughs> It's a wonderful segue from ospreys. It's the next ecological layer out. You know, about the time the nesting ospreys stop, that's where the loons stop, start. 
and, and nobody had ever really done much with non-breeding biology of moons. It's cold, it's windy, it's winter, and, and it, it is a challenging thing to study, but I was young enough and tough enough and foolish enough to take it on. Okay, so here we go again. You see this is a feeding perch. You can identify the menhaden. Notice that these fish have a tremendous amount of blood in them, too. And, and when they're bringing them into the nest, uh, often from from they're they're very they're very oxygenated they're perfused with blood you figure they're putting out a lot of their it's a vegetarian diet or a plankton sometimes zooplankton diet they're moving all the time through the water and they have to metabolize that and they need oxygen they need oxygen for their muscles so basically as an osprey totes a, a, a menhaden in often you can see the blood streaming off it and this is right in good old connecticut you know I, but i tell people i say hey it's like the plains of africa <laughs> so uh, so there we are now the other quote i like is shakespeare out of macbeth who who, who would have thought he had so much blood in him <laughs> now early in the season sometimes the menhaden aren't so abundant we we have a lot of evidence we don't think that the food before the menhaden arrive because they're they're strongly migratory. So the month of April is interesting, and I've done studies, and Melina has done studies. As far as we know, the food is adequate to make the eggs and such things like white perch, channel cats, brown bullhead, alewives are big where they are, and, and we're hoping to restore river herring. Um, but because the food is still somewhat scarce, you get efforts at klepto. This is a famous Saybrook lighthouse, and uh, sometimes the gulls succeed, or the bald eagle. Other times it's just magnificent to watch a laden osprey outfly one of these klepto parasites. There's a lot of that, and sometimes, as the season goes on, the bald eagle and the osprey troll each other. There's no question an osprey will take a, a fragment of food, he's not doing anything else, and he'll kind of cruise around and say, make my day. <laughs> it's an aerial ballet. It's beautiful to watch, and both species are obviously enjoying it. Uh, and it, it, it's really a, a wonderful thing. Again, it makes you think about non-human intelligence, you know, in a sense of, there's this lovely sense of otherness, and it's one of the things that, you can do this as a naturalist bird watcher, too. You just have to slow yourself down don't get obsessed with the size of your bird list. When something interesting is going on, forget about the next species. Just hunker down, make yourself quiet, watch what's going on and ask what's going on. Think about the ecology, the habitat. Why is this animal doing what it's doing? You could do this in Africa, you could do it in Costa Rica, but you can do it right here in Connecticut. And in some ways it's easier here because many of our species the animals we share this place with are pretty well adapted to us, and within limits, they just about ignore us. It's a nice way to get out of yourself. You know, there's a lovely, uh, um, there's a quote I should mention at this point. Um, I, I, and one was Henry Beston's The Outermost House. We used to take the Peterson's beat up old canoe and put it on the car, and in late May, we'd run up to Chatham and canoe out to Monomoy to watch the shorebird migration. So Beston spent this year out on the Cape uh, and wrote a book about it. And he concludes, fundamental to this was his understanding that creation is instant and eternal. It's happening with every breath of a wind, with every time an osprey catches a fish. Um, and, and these things collectively are functions of eternity, studied by astrophysicists, geologists, evolutionary biologists. And we get our slice of that. This is a very helpful uh, concept, uh, understanding spiritual practice, if you will, to have as a naturalist when you go out into the field, that you are participating in a witness to this creation process. Now, when the fish get abundant, everybody wants a piece of the action, as you can see. Again, Chris Rowe is the guy to catch it, though. The genius of Chris Rowe is revealed in that picture, if anyone had any doubts, which you shouldn't. And as I said, nest site limitation is a big thing. This is the south end of Great Island. There's that lighthouse again. This is a beautiful nest site on a big driftwood log, but of course it doesn't have a prayer of being productive. So these are starter nests for younger birds, and in the fullness of time, assuming they survive, and many are long-lived, they will gain access uh, to uh, the right kinds of site and mate within the osprey garden. In the meantime, that's that, oh, by the way, that's that state landing where you can go to take this all, and you can see it's a lovely 
rural spot there in Old Lyme, uh, and, and this is uh, you get to watch these nests. You bring a little scope with you, or bring ten power binoculars if you have them. They're more useful for this than eights. Bring your eights to watch the yellow warblers in the bushes. Yeah. Bring the tens. It's nice to sort of you know have both pairs. It's very very cool and professional to wear both pairs hanging on your hips. Okay. And also these young ospreys, they, they tend to have a smaller clutch size, a smaller reproductive investment. The females, I guess their ovaries are just getting up to speed, whatever, so that they're usually two egg clutches. This gets us back to this lovely scientific documentation of ospreys because the eggs are so beautiful that in the old days the oologists, the egg collectors, prized osprey eggs and there were dusty old museum cases full of these blown out eggs that we could use as controls during the DDT era. Nobody could have predicted that. That was just one of those. So that, that's the way, you know, when you get out on a project, um, there'll be some things that fall your way and others that don't. And you have to be, as a field biologist or any scientist doing any kind of science, you have to be oppor opportunistic and know enough Hopefully that you don't have to wait until the Menhaden falls on your head. Um, you have to be, you have to know enough and be keen enough to figure out where your point of entry for understanding, for scientific understanding, is going to be. Now here, as I said, we have this limitation, but look what the birds. This is the great part. The birds are going back to natural nest sites. We're going up the Connecticut River, and that's a dead tree of some sort. That's a perfectly good nest. We'll probably produce here. Here. Famous East Hampton, uh, East Haddam Swing Bridge, that's a good speed opera house, and the nest is right up at the top there, and, and they like it, they build a special platform for it. So that's kind of a classic Connecticut osprey nest. No need to apologize for Connecticut folks. We are, we are there, and the ospreys know it, and we know it too. Okay, so one of the very interesting things in the day with a nice letter from Roger Peterson, I was able to get onto Gardner's Island, which used to have about 300 ground nesting ospreys. And it had been decimated by DDT, but also by the overharvest of menhaden. And so what I found as I followed the birds through the decade of the 70s for my doctorate at Cornell, was that while these areas, the reproduction bounced right back, that didn't happen out here. There was a lot of what they call broodside reduction, nestling starvation. And over that period, after the effects of DDT, um, osprey, Gardner's Island ospreys have pretty much roughly tracked what we know about the abundance of menhaden. And out here there's no nest site limitation because this island remains predator free. The birds can nest right on the ground. This is a, a classic food limited situation and as such it's been fascinating for me and for others who've had the privilege of going out there, which is quite a sticky wicket these days. I don't get out there anymore, but some of you will know that all of these habitats have significant numbers of ospreys on them. And if Plum Island becomes a refuge, it was a day before Plum Island was uh, fortified at the Spanish-American War, when it was a private holding where sheep were run, there were a hundred ne osprey nests on Plum Island. And that was almost certainly fueled by menhaden, which go these are wonderful menhaden habitats. The deal with gardeners is it doesn't have that great estuarine boost uh, the men here are here in open water, so it's a simpler system and, and, and an important one in terms of understanding the uh, abundance of the fish, which is what I'm arguing for in subsequent research. This, uh, forgive this is still on a, a drafted form here, but the, the point here, uh, this is a 50-year time, this year will be a 50-year time series. And, and what we have, that red line is replacement rate in ospreys, about 0.8 young per active nest. So here this is probably still some residual DDT effects. Here the menhaden were in good shape. There was a run of about 17 years when the menhaden were doing quite well and the ospreys jumped up above replacement. And then striped bass become abundant again in the whole system. And menhaden have some problems for a while and so do the Gardner's Island ospreys. So you see, here's the nests. They go down, and then they there's a lag effect because it takes a while for the ospreys to mature, and then they crash again, associated with this low menhaden abundance. And then finally, um, at the end of this time period, for about five years, the ASMFC, this regulatory agency, weighs in, and the menhaden, for various reasons, have a couple good years. Anyhow, they reduce the harvest of the fish, and um, the Gardner's Island ospreys. Look, let me go back again. 
The Gardner's Island ospreys are on the way up, and this reproduction argues they're going to continue on the way up. I worry a little bit when I submit my papers about this to the ASMFC that I'm being naive that somebody's, because formerly those waters were some of the great Menhaden harvest uh, waters back in the old days before the southern harvest kicked in. And then there'll, there'll be people who say, oh, well, the Menhaden are back, let's go out and, uh, and fish them. So I worry a little about that, about that conflict between truth seeking and um, uh, people taking advantage of a situation, which as all of you will know is a fundamental conflict in a lot of situations these days. Um, okay, so uh, here we have one of our key data things is this Maryland uh, Juvenile Atlantic uh, SANE survey data, and, and this is just what I showed you in terms of this, is a, there's a lag effect. But this is this great period uh, when the fish were abundant and then the, the bass become abundant in here, uh, back in Chesapeake Bay, and it goes down again, and Gardner's Island suffers, and, and, and that has not recovered. That, that same survey remains low, and we think that what's happening is that for various reasons, the New England uh, and, and New Jersey birds, uh, fish rather, have um, regained enough reproductive capacity and this is the kind of thing you see, of course, uh, ospreys are, can catch one menhaden at a time, humpback whales do much better, and they're, they're right there in the New York bite, um, and this is a wonderful thing, of course, the whale, Gotham whale, the whale watching out of New York City. Interesting point here on Long Island, and when I first went over, you know, Connecticut, boy, I was, what, 20, 21 years old, I got on the ferry to Orient Point. In the old days, it was an old landing ship, SLS, whatever they call them for tank, LST, LSR, some LSV. And, and I met an old naturalist who was banding ospreys on the East End and, and had a whole youthful adventure out on the East End, end of Long Island. And I discovered that nobody called them menhaden over there. They were called moss bunkers, or just bunkers. And you'll hear the term bunkers in Connecticut, too. That goes back to old New Amsterdam. The Dutch, when they came in, called them Mars Bankers. And that's out of, that's out of a, a, there's a European fish, a, a fish that, that's called the Mars Banker. And that, that term, uh, you know, there's lots of hints of old Dutch influence if you go around New York, the Hudson Valley and such, and that term has held on into, been translated into Mars Banker. So it's rather nice to see the, boss, the Mars Bonker coming back to the New York Bight, which has analogies, to, of course, to our Connecticut River. It's a big estuary laden with nutrients, so it's a good Menhaden place. Good whale place, apparently, too. Oh. Yeah. yeah, you can see this, you know, this is called this lunge feeding in humpies, you know. In the late summer and early autumn, um, there are places there that they have whale watches, and you can go out and... Uh, Enjoy this whole spectacle from New York City. New York deserves this. I mean, come on, it is New York. Uh, now, the really efficient uh, harvesters, I'm sorry the picture isn't any better. It's the best one I've been able to find. The really efficient harvesters of human beings to the point that they can hugely affect the population are really efficient harvesters of men are human beings. This is purse seining with small boats. The purse seining has been drawn close, and we just have pixels here, but all those pixels are men -hating. It's a big, deep-running seine that's drawn in together. And so this has happened over the years, and, and some years, the intensity of the commercial harvest. The, Reedville, Virginia is the base for most of this. This is the Omega Protein co country, Company, and these are the mother ships. And this is a fraught political situation, which is not going to go away, because, of course, this is a corporation, and corporations want to maximize their profits and their growth. So what we have, to summarize here, the scientists with regard to Menhaden have two parameters that they measure through various forms. One is the stock, the short number of fish out there. The other is their fecundity, their capacity uh, to reproduce in subsequent years. There's some debate about these, but it's these parameters that are used now to regulate the harvest and put quotas on the harvest. Uh, and you have essentially three levels. This is a very simplification, of course. If they overharvest, which they did in some years and for a number of years, the population goes way down. That's not sustainable. The commercial fishery suffers, and we all suffer, and so do the Gardner's Island ospreys. Uh, and then there's a middle level uh, where they get what they want, um, but we don't all necessarily get what we want, the ecological. This is what we're aiming for and what the ASMFC is aiming for. 
And we have to weigh in with our citizen support of both Audubon societies, uh, the Pew Environmental Trust. There are websites where you can look at this. Pew has a very good one. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation has a very good one. And, and, and there are other sources. Right now, it's in abeyance because they acted last fall and increased the quotas somewhat. They will not uh, meet, uh, decide about this again until late 2019. And in the meantime, they are trying to come up with so-called ecological reference points to guide their, heart, their, their quotas. And that's all fisheries biology. I'm the outsider, the, the interloper in this, arguing that there are times and places, and I've shown you a couple of them, where you can use osprey reproduction for these ecological reference points. Other places you can do it are probably Jamaica Bay, New York, and Sandy Hook, New Jersey, on either side of that great New York bite estuary, and probably down in South Jersey around Cape May County, too. So I will stay with this, and so will my colleagues, and I, I urge you to stay tuned and go to the websites and, and make your, there are times when letters need to be written, and that becomes evident when you go to the websites. Right now, it's a time to lay back and think about it. But again, with regard to omegas, the elephant in the room, because they still take about two thirds of the fish. They're the one. There were formerly other commercial operations, and there's still bait operations, small bait operations. Nobody much minds the bait operations because they're small uh, operations, and that bait goes right into a human food chain. It's used for crab and lobster bait, and the fish have increased enough in the last five years that they're getting up to Maine again. One mark of ecological sustainability is that the Menhaden occupy their former range and their summer migration took them up to Maine and they're back there that now. And the Maine harvesters love it, of course, because that goes right into lobster bait. So this is as much a human story as it is a fish story and it will continue to be. But what you need to know is that Omega has a whole hand of cards uh, that you don't know about when they're arguing the Atlantic. The Gulf Menhaden is a slightly different species but several things are fundamentally different. And notice this is a typical average year where the Gulf harvest, these are metric tons. The Menhaden harvest in, in North America is the second uh, largest by weight. Alaskan pollock is the only larger one. But of course, it's not a food fish. It's being, men, uh, Omega is rendering it down into meal and oil. And some of that oil, of course, is going into these big fatty uh, acid capsules. And that's wiggle room for them because they get a lot higher profit margin on that than they do on their, um, on their uh, meal. So several fundamental differences. And this is the kind of argument, this will be in my loon book. And it's the kind of argument that, that needs to be made. Um, we could start down at the bottom. In the Gulf, the culture is uh, states like Louisiana and Mississippi. It's an extractive culture. Think of the offshore wells, you know. It's a part of the world where people make their living off of the resources that are out there. Here we are in an ecological culture where dense populations and we we need our ecology. This is our this is our legacy, this is our culture. We need the food fish, we need the ospreys. So there's some fundamental differences between the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast. If you go over to Florida, of course, you're getting into ecological culture again. Also, uh, this is a, a much more complicated food chain, and, and so um, the, the predators and the food fish have options beyond the menhaden. Our food chain along the Atlantic is quite a lot simpler, and that, that again makes us vulnerable to menhaden over harvest. This is big. Any of you who know about um, population ecology, uh, just the fact that these fish mature a year earlier um, it makes them uh, much more robust in the face of harvest. And then another thing is that the Gulf is approximately an east-west uh, harvest versus the north-south. This is a, what we call an intercept fishery here along the Atlantic coast. So um, don't let anybody kid you. When Omega, Omega will basically, they'll, they'll take everything they can get. And with the current anti-regulatory um, vibe coming out of the White House, um, they feel like they have the wind in their sails. And, and we have to stand our ground. When you're faced with a grand disruptor, you have to stand your ground, you have to go to your data, and you have to tell the truth. And this is true in biology as it is in many other fields. And the thing with Omega on the Atlantic side, they're based in Virginia, somewhere down here in Reedville. And this is, a Maryland, by the way, uh, has uh, its only pound nets. There's no uh, purse seining in the state of Maryland. And for decades, 
Um, there's been this contrast between Maryland and Virginia politically. It's changing a little now because Virginia is going blue, and Omega appealed their current quota to Virginia. It's still a big quota, and they didn't get anywhere with the Virginia legislature and the state house, and that's a good thing. If you go back all the way to the Roosevelt era, era to the 30s, the, those who believe in government are up on the north side of the Beltway in Maryland, and Maryland has an old tradition as a blue state of regulating and protecting resources. Virginia has an old tradition of exploiting. And in terms of migratory Manhattan, they, they still have these Virginia waters, and they're absolutely key waters in terms of Manhattan biology, because of course this is a production area, and this is your intercept fishery out here. The good news is that it looks like the, um, the uh, uh, New Jersey and New England fish are really kicking in more reproduction than we thought. That science is coming along. So that, that on multiple fronts, one has to consider what's going on. And I, I, I in a sense, love the complexity of this, but, but, but it is there. So the simple aspect of it is to be at the osprey nests and look at brood size. And, and there's a whole cadre of birds that are experienced professional birds. They produce their young about the same time. All you really need is one to check later than this, later in nesting. Um, and and, and uh, what I found over in the Connecticut over three years was the mean brood size was 2.5. And what I want people to do is not only get that brood size data down the sound, uh, but associate with the age of the young, because if the birds lay late, they'll have smaller brood sizes, because they're not really experienced ospreys yet. You saw that two egg clutch. And, and of course, we need the delivery data too, so you need to take your natural history observations beyond the osprey and into watching the feeding of the osprey. And the next few pictures are just the pleasures of field work. Um, and you know, you never know what you, you get up, that's right, this is, this is called my hey buddy picture. And, uh, you know, you put, you run that ladder up and there they are. <laughs> that's it, yeah, what, what species are you? <laughs> See, they're playing dead, but they haven't figured out they have to close their eyes. <laughs> So, of course, there's that sacred moment which is imminent. This is already happening right now in Connecticut. It will be happening over the next two or three weeks, three weeks of a newborn osprey. Always a great, a great moment. Instancy and eternity of creation. There it is. And then they don't know. They don't know yet that I'm not, not an osprey. They're begging food for me. I think that third egg was, might have been about to pip. I'm not sure. And then they look really reptilian for a little while. And then, then, then it's, this pair is like the ones you just saw, you know, there. And notice they're somewhat cryptic still. And then finally, of course, um, you get this lovely point where eight weeks later they become ospreys. From eight, eight weeks from that little creature to an osprey, this is a wonderful thing, of course. And then we have this whole period from July through September when we get to watch these young birds. We, the adults are very active, still bringing fish in, particularly the males. The males stay longer and within limits they provision, and then amenin is a fairly easy fish to catch, so this is a good deal for the young ospreys too, with them up at the top of the water column. And we have this final uh, fledging uh, event. And that's what I wanted to tell you, and I hope you're still not too hot, and I hope most of you have, I, I hope I've spoken for about the right amount of time. Uh, and I'll be glad to take some questions, but I'd also be glad to, I'm in no hurry to leave, so uh, I, um, I'm here. At, uh, I'm very grateful to you all for your kind attention and, and um, for all of you. This is a great audience. And, and just remember that uh, Melina and Genevieve are in the back, and there's a great deal that uh, they can tell you. And of course, Johnny Osprey's seat is here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very Yes. Um, why do some of the ospreys um, migrate to here, and why is there a population that stays in the Florida Keys? Um, population that's fit doesn't migrate. Ospreys are a very successful creature. They occur over a significant portion of the world, and some of the populations are resident, and some of them are migrant. And, uh, <coughs> Florida is a very good place for ospreys. Uh, there's high densities at certain lakes in Florida. Yes, they're out. Florida Bay is a great place for ospreys. 
and they do pretty darn well. And that replacement rate is the key to that. They still get up and reproduce enough above the replacement. Their, their clutch sizes and their brood sizes average smaller down there, but they still do well. The Great Osprey Heartland is from Virginia up to Maine. And, and you all know, you, you've heard enough about migratory birds that you know a lot of birds come up out of the tropics uh, because it's a reduced predation and it's a bloom of food. The same is true for ospreys. And up here, they produce brood sizes um, that uh, enable them to get well above that replacement rate. Right? Different parts of the world, the, re the ecology will be different and the density will be different. There's pretty good numbers of ospreys some places down in Baja on both the Pacific and the Gulf side. The southernmost breeding ospreys in the New World are down in Belize and they're in the offshore reef system. There aren't very many of them. There might be, uh, Belize is about 175 miles long. There might be 50 nests all told there. They don't fledge very many young, and they're not in along the coast. There's some predation factor. They're out in the offshore reef. And Alan Poole and I have a, have a little study of that going, and it's rather painless to go down in. <laughs> <laughs> I should mention that my colleague Alan Poole of 45 years has a, has a lovely book coming out on ospreys, and you should look for that as well. And that hopefully will lift all our boats and it will lift the Osprey's boat. Yeah. Uh, we're blessed to have an asset in West River. Right. The cans are showing four eggs each. Yes. Well, that's... And they were a little later. I remember you saying that the later, maybe the less. We're going to have eight. Eight eggs to check. Well, that doesn't mean you'll have young. And remember, well, Bruce. Don't know they're going to all be viable. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope so. I, you know, proximal biscum, I hope you're right. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, um, but in fact, the, the, the brood reduction will tell the story. It'll be a, the, the evidence. That's, that's precisely why they're so wonderful to study, because if food is really abundant, you will have eight young. We do get four young broods here in Connecticut, and if there are enough men eating out there, and if the male is a good enough provider, it's, it's also, you, you know, when you're doing, you want a sample size of nests. That's why you want an osprey garden. You've got two, two dozen nests on Great Island. Terry, I was just out with him a couple of days ago, the East River and Neck River in Guilford are gorgeous, and he's got up close to 20 nests there. So that gives you, that allows for these variations in clutch size, in the, the, the fertility of the female, the skill of the male. You need a sample size in order to get this yeah. readout, and, and you're going to have it right at your finger. Yeah, I should have mentioned Osprey cams, of course, ha have revolutionized this whole business and that all of us can be at our desk, and you can just put the tab up there, and ospreys are noisy birds. When something's happened at the happening at the nest, you'll hear about it, and then you just bring the screen up. Boss and you walks by. What you, your boss walks by. <laughs> no, well, there's that. Just start. So yeah, of like course, you, 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 you now you've got everybody here keyed in to look at these osprey cams, and thank you for that to see just just what will happen. And I just have one more thing. Please. To mention. Yes. There and have an asset. Yeah. Um, Papa Osprey is madly in love with his wife. Uh -huh. He's at the nest all the time. Uh -huh. He's bringing her pieces of paper, pieces of pastry, <laughs> pieces <laughs> of glass. <laughs> I think you are absolutely right. I think this is about the pair bond. And the, the, the way I, you know, my whole life reading about ospreys from the old literature, they bring all this stuff into the nest, all kinds of strange things. They bring duck wings, they bring little dollies, you name it. And, 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 and again, it's not a human aesthetic exactly, but... Um, Howard and, brings me gifts. I'm sorry? But now, Howard brings me gifts. He's <laughs> <laughs> of strength. All right. Well, well here's, here's what, this is very important now. Um, there's an extremely gifted uh, ornithologist at the Peabody Museum now named Rick Prum, and he's written a very provocative and wonderful book called The Evolution of Beauty. And, and it, it is a Darwin, uh, apparently Darwin wrote a second book about sexual selection after the origin of species, and he argued that this wasn't all nature red in tooth and claw, uh, and it wasn't all about the biggest and the toughest winning. The, a lot of it is about mate choice and about female mate choice. And he studied birds in which, you know, mannequins, and he talks about the Millet Argus pheasant, etc. It's a wonderful book. And all of a sudden it clicked for me, you know, these are gifts. This is, 
the male is bringing these things in and it is reinforcing the pair bond. And, and this is again, this is the evolution of beauty from an Osprey's point of view. <laughs> yeah. the, the best one is at the New Haven Osprey nest last year, the male brought in a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> From a nearby cemetery. From a nearby cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> That's really wonderful. Yes, plastic. Of course, plastic. In summer and fall, I see men in schools that are thick enough to walk. Yeah. And yet the osprey seems to hunt at their I haven't really thought about that. It's an interesting question. Needless to say, say humpback whales chow down on that. And so do, so do many human harvesters of menhaden. That is, you, you know, the, the old term for it was that menhaden would purple the water, which is what you're talking about. There's a great old monograph out of the Smithsonian, 19, 1880 or something, G. Brown Good. A classic uh, monograph on the Menahem because they've always been commercially very valuable. And the quote is a fish whose purpose was clearly to be, be eaten. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, in Brantford, all of our platforms are occupied. Now they're occupying the, a lot of dead trees, but also all the cell towers. Well, this is an issue. There, there's a, yeah, it is an issue. Nuisance ospreys are an issue, and DEP doesn't want more platforms for that reason. There's somebody, I've never met him, I don't know his name, who makes at least part of his living consulting with cell tower companies to either keep ospreys off the towers or mitigate them such that they're not hurting the function of the tower because, of course, to use an old behavioral term, for an osprey, a cell tower is a super optimal stimulus. Please, please. You know, I know that DDT and sublite is gone, but we have many new pesticides, known carcinogenic pesticides. And I see um, homeowners and companies right on the marshes using tons of pesticides. And what is the effect on the marsh and the Manhattan? And the I can't, I can't give you any kind of a quantitative, rigorous answer to that. It, it's clear. Um, the formation of the EPA was um, in response, really. The DDT was the birth of the EPA under Richard Nixon. 1972 was the beginning of the EPA, and um, it was also the banning of DDT. And there's been tremendous amount of toxicological. Uh, I, uh, the question uh, there's been an effort uh, on the part of you know the guy running the EPA is doing his best to gut some things you know you know and it be anti-science. So this is your concern is well founded, um, but I can't necessarily speak to individual toxins. I can tell you this: uh, when I was um, in the 70s, I was involved in the lab analyzing for DDT residues. And there were unknown peaks coming off of the gas chromatograph, and I so I was present when PCBs was under when it was discovered that PCBs, which are chemically fairly related, um, were also building up in food chains. Uh, but we never had any evidence that PCBs were affecting osprey reproduction. When when I studied it through the 70s, and it was a great pleasure to stay with the study through the 70s and write a write a thesis on 10 years of osprey data with lots of citizen, I, would, I have lots of citizen science help too, just as we do now. Um, the, we published in Science multi-author and uh, reproduction went up, DDE residues went down, but PCB stayed right there, just coincident with recovered reproduction. So, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Toxicology is sort of quirky stuff, as we know, and that's why they're so enormously careful about um, licensing use of compounds. You may know, we can talk about this later, you know, may know there was this crazy thing about this anti-inflammatory diclofenac, which, caught, was, which killed off most of the vultures in India, which has caused absolute chaos with Indian ecology because, of course, they were eating all those dead cows and, and uh, there, were, there were a number of 
pariah dogs have come up, rabies has become an epidemic, and this is all because nobody had a clue, just as with DDT, nobody had a clue it was going to affect birds. Diclofenac uh, wipes out those vultures. But again, to give you a sense for the specificity, our lab, our Patuxent lab in Maryland, has tested uh, the vultures of the New World are a very different evolutionary stock than those of the Old World. They're not closely related at all. They're convergent evolution. And diclofenac doesn't touch turkey vultures and black vultures. Oh. So this is my answer to you as far as the intense specificity. And that, what, what that means is that we need a lot of toxicologists out there. Risk assessment it is a big and serious business. And anybody who tries to uh, destroy those very mechanism, I mean, we're talking culture now, 1972, you know, this is, this is a, a, a toxicological culture that has evolved ever since then. And anybody who attempts to um, destroy it or mitigate it is doing an enormous uh, disservice to humanity. That's my answer. Yeah. I saw down uh, on my computer that New Haven for Edgewood Park and instead of spraying for the invasive weeds that they have in there, they have goats ah. in there that are eating, you know, yeah. the invasive things that are spraying, yeah. you know, to keep it, you know, Nice. Well, there are lots of creative answers out there, and that's that's a great thing about the wave of green consciousness, that it it results in uh, it results in pretty good answers. Maybe I'll take one more question. I don't mean to keep you in this warm room. And then, uh, I, as I said, I'm not going anywhere. If there are any brownies left, I'd like one. But if... <laughs> I guess, yes. I wanted to ask, um, during incubation, will the pairs switch off for the male sometimes? Oh, yes, and it's a very beautiful thing because um, uh, Terry and I saw this in Guilford the other afternoon. Uh, basically, uh, that male doesn't, he's, he, there's a lot of role division in ospreys. The male is smaller than the female, and mostly he's lighter than the female. The difference in weight is greater than the difference in size. So he doesn't have the mass to make the eggs, and he doesn't have the mass to transfer heat and cold weather. Plus, he's wet because he's been hunting. Uh, but what happens is in favorable weather, of course, he gives you a break. It was a beautiful warm afternoon a couple afternoons ago, and when we first got out there, we saw that a couple nests. We saw the female sitting on a perch near the nest with a full crop. You can tell when any raptor has fed because they have a bulge right here and that is slowly released into their digestive system. And the bird incubating the eggs on this lovely warm afternoon was that male who provided that full crop as well. But probably uh, it varies with pairs of birds too. There's, just as with human marriages, there's various uh, amount of role, the role division, although it, it's kind of constrained in ospreys and in some wildlife because of the morphological differences in the birds or in species that are involved. But some males are more, are more incubators than others. And there's one more footnote on this. And this, it's funny, you know, when you study something for 50 years, uh, you may get an answer to a question 50 years later, you know, there's some questions you'll never get answered. So it's very humbling that way, but it's, it's also very beautiful in terms of a vocation and in terms of science, because we're all collectively, society is on this learning curve, and you have your own piece of it, you have your colleagues. Ospreys are a great species for collegiality, because loads of people study them. They're a great graduate student burden. My point. Um, bald eagles have a longer, have a shorter incubation period than ospreys. This puzzled us, you know. But bald eagles have a body down, a thick body down. They were all the way resident up in Alaska. And you know that when they take fish, they don't get their body wet. They just go grab them with their talons. Well, ospreys are a total immersion thing. So ospreys don't have a body down. That would be like operating in a within, within a sponge, you know. The net result, apparently, and given where they're incubating and everything, is that their energy transfer to the eggs is less efficient. And thus, the incubation period is both longer. It's also highly variable. Uh, the shortest recorded is 35 days. The longest is around 43 or so. And that comes right out of this, these morphological differences. So, so, you know, that's part of the pleasure of doing ecological study on a species that you get to know really well. You begin to see and you know, this isn't 20 years, this isn't 100 years. These are things that have evolved. This is the instancy and eternity of creation. It's the eternity of creation that these things have evolved over eons. And there you are, uh, scientists teasing them out in your particular slice of time, which is, of course, 
Um, yeah, go ahead. Not to my knowledge, but we can talk about that. I'm going to let these very patient folks go. We'll